Our next question is from Javier in Orlando. I'm 42 years old. I have a wife and a seven-year-old son. I recently uh, lost my job, and I am one of those guys who climbed the corporate ladder, worked at a very, uh, very nice corporate job as a, as a director, and making well into six figures. And uh, luckily for me, I lost my job because I've been trying to follow my passion which is to create and develop video games. And I've always wanted to pursue it, but my debt and my consumption uh, always got in the way. So I have been trying to work with my, my spouse to be able to find a new way to downsize, take the equity in our house, pay off our bills. We have a condo that's $80,000 that we that we owe on it that we would like to pay off. It's, it's my mother-in-law, so we need to pay that off. I also have about 23000 in that student loan debt from getting my master's degree and my four-year degree that I would like to pay off. And then I would also like to put a good chunk down on a house. And finding a home for under $300,000 is very difficult in our area. I know that downsizing to a, a smaller house that fits what your needs are is the key. But what about the location? Because a lot of times when you downsize, you're also downsizing the quality of your, your neighbors and your the location that you're in. And if you have children, you have to consider those things, especially with the school system. So I want to hear your thoughts on what would be your recommendation for downsizing but also taking into consideration the location because you end up with a smaller property, you end up closer to people, you lose some of your privacy, and uh, a lot of times you also have a, a lesser location. Dude, this is important to consider, man. What's which part? Well, <laughs> that he, he's downsizing. And uh, yes, you know, um, I think as a minimalist, uh, we're trying to find the space that's most appropriate for us, right? But so he didn't, he if didn't, he's got too big of a space, but did he? He and, didn't. He alluded to that, but I don't know that he said that. And that's I'm a little worried here because he didn't allude to the fact that he, his space was too big or inappropriate for his yeah, life. Yeah, I think it was about expenses, is what he was talking about. Yeah. So he's trying to save some money. So it is so important to consider all these factors that he's talking about. Uh, when he's moving, so he's right. But I disagree with with the the sentiment. He said, "I know that downsizing." I wrote this down. Downsizing is the key. Downsizing is not the key. Being debt free is the key for him right mm, now. Yeah. And and I think pursuing the wrong thing. If mm -hmm. your pursuit is downsizing, you'll never have a small enough house because you get into the 200 square foot house and you see someone with the 150 square foot house. Yeah. I, I, that's the way I took when he said downsizing. Downsizing is key to me. It sounded like. Ultimately, what he was saying is, is downsizing is what it's going to take for me and my family to get to uh, the meaningful life that we want to get to. Okay. So uh, considering that, yes, like if uh, you want to live in Beverly Hills, right. you're going to pay a premium. Now it's a nicer neighborhood, maybe nicer school district, right. so forth and so on. You move to uh, South Central, it's going to be a lot more affordable, mm -hmm. not the best school district. Right. However, so there, there has to be a middle ground there somewhere, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And... and I, and just because the cost of your house, he said if you're downsizing the size of your house, it means you may, might have to move to a different neighborhood mm -hmm. and you're downsizing the quality of the relationships in the neighborhood. I don't agree with that. I mean, I've lived, you and I grew up really poor and there were great people and there were terrible people living in our, our respective neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we are fortunate enough now to not live in, in, in a neighborhood like that. However, um, there are still good people and bad people who live in my building my apartment building that that we live in yeah and 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 so i think that just because you're downsizing your space doesn't mean that you downsize the quality of your relationships of in course fact, not uh, most of the the sort of middle income places houses that he's talking about you often improve your relationship because you you, you become um you enter into a proximity of a community of people who yeah. care about that community. Well, I mean, the things that he listed off, he said, you know, smaller property, quality of neighbors, school system, closer to people, lose some privacy, lesser location. I mean, those sounds like those are preferences that are very, very important to him. Sure. And my biggest advice, Javier, is 
just like with Sarah, get clear on your preferences, get clear on your family's preferences. That's where you've got to start. I mean, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, where we started with minimalism. It was, oh, let's get clear on what our actual priorities are. Uh And now let's talk about how we can act on these priorities and live a meaningful life. The same thing here is where uh, Javier needs to get clear on what his preferences are. And once he has those uncovered, then he can start approaching neighborhoods and start approaching houses and, and figuring out what, uh, what what is going to be within his price range, and he's going to, going to compromise as little preferences as possible. I think there's always a compromise. Like when I think about Mariah and I's new place, mm-hmm. our place is awesome, dude. One of the best views I have seen in the city. Like it's so freaking. The only view better that I can think of is on top of the Netflix building. That one is awesome. <laughs> but the neighborhood sucks. Uh-huh. Like the, dude, I was I was telling Sean I was walking to work this morning. There was at least a half a dozen people just like sleeping on the street and, and and it's not that I have anything against homeless people but it just it just tells the type of neighborhood that it's in it's in Hollywood it's a bit rough around the edges in Hollywood mm-hmm. it's safe um I just had this realization the other day like my life's probably not in danger around here like I might get heckled or someone might you know there might be a crazy person like throwing something at me but like right. it's really not that dangerous but what I'm getting at is is that Mariah and I we chose and we discussed what our our, our, our preferences were we got really and you clear rank them you prioritize yes. what your preferences and the are view was huge for us like the view was like number one or number two and for me it doesn't matter at all and so list. you have to factor that in right yeah 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 so the neighborhood for us it was it was obviously lower on the preferences yeah and for me it was much higher right. I, I wanted a particular type of walkability and 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 particular uh, group of people to be around a community yes like I would definitely say uh, the, the the I don't want to say that the neighbors that we have are lesser quality than, than the neighbors that you have. Right. But, you know, to, to Javier's point, like it is a different, there's a different community in, in Hollywood versus, versus where you're at. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so uh, the, the thing that I wanted to say early on to Javier was congratulations for losing your job. Sometimes we need to be pushed. He said, right? luckily I lost my job. Yeah. Dude, that is so awesome. It's great framing. And I, yeah. I, I, I say bravo to you for that. Heck However, yeah. You have debt right now. You might have to find another job temporarily. Yeah, man. And I think that's an important thing to realize. It doesn't mean you have to go back and be in the corporate world for a long period of time, but you have to figure if your outcome is to get out of debt, then that requires you're going to have to do some stuff that don't align with your long-term vision, but your long-term vision is actually to live life debt-free. Now, you've got some other stuff here. You've, it sounds like he has $23,000 of student loans. Mm-hmm. Not that big big of a deal on the grand scope of things, but you have an $80,000 condo. You said it's your mother-in-law's condo. I have no idea what you're doing with that, but you don't. If you if you owe money on that, get rid of it. If you have a a, a, a rental property that, that that but you you don't actually own it, the bank owns it. Find a way to get rid of that because that is a burden on you right now. Now th- that said, it could also be a blessing if it's paid off and it's making you rental income every month, and yeah. that that is great. But you're not in a position to be in debt for a a rental property, mm-hmm. and so whatever you have to do to get out of debt. That sounds like he wants to sell his house. He wants mm-hmm. to sell this condo. But you're also going to, if that doesn't get you the money you need to pay off a uh, pay off your house and put enough down on a smaller house uh, and pay off the rest of your debt, then you're going to have to get a, a job for a while. And there's no shame in that. It's okay. In fact, there should be a lot of pride and I'm working my butt off so I can become debt free and I'm never going to go back into debt again, other than this mortgage, which by the way, I'm going to hustle really hard to pay off this mortgage too. Yeah. Man, Javier, when you get debt free, buddy, that is like the sound, the sound of debt free doesn't feel like the feeling it gives you when you think about being debt-free. It's the, the feeling is so much better when you are actually debt-free. Right. Like I felt even more free than I thought I was going to feel <laughs> being debt-free. But, uh, you know, getting back to what you talked about earlier, he's got to find the middle ground here. Yes. I mean, if it's about uh, saving money and getting debt-free and if that's his number one goal, then move to Boone County, Kentucky. <sighs> Go buy yourself a, house, a decent house for 20000 bucks <laughs> and <laughs> pay off your debt. Now, right. uh, probably don't want to move to Boone County, Kentucky, but but that's why it's so important to find this middle ground. Yeah. So so, wh- how, so when you, when they're listing out preferences, what? How do you prioritize those? Meaning, do you look at the top five? Because you know, for Mariah and I, I think maybe we probably looked at the top five. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess you know, do you got any advice on that? Where when yeah. go for it? Yeah. So I, I think it requires the whole family. Um, Absolutely. Your, your son's seven, so I wouldn't consider his preferences nearly as much. Um, <laughs> And in fact, I think that's one of the problems we often do is we over consider our children's preferences. Like, what? 
hey, uh, sweetheart, what do you want for dinner? No, here, here's what you're going to eat for dinner. You're seven years old. <laughs> and I'm going to decide what, because you're going to say you want, you know, uh, Pop Tarts or whatever for dinner. You mm -hmm. don't get to decide that. Yeah. Right. So, however, you want to keep your son's best interest in mind when you're making it. That's part of the decision. And, and someone who's seven doesn't always have their own long term best interests in mind. Yeah. I, I think back to Dayton, Ohio is a good example. It's not just the city, it's the neighborhood, depending on what your preferences are. Right. Like if I move back to Dayton now, I'd probably want to move to a place like Oakwood because their schools are an A and Dayton public city schools are graded an F. And, and mm. even though they're half a mile apart, yeah. Uh, literally, I mean, you, you go to University of Dayton and you cross the street, you're in Oakwood, but right. you're in an A school district, and yeah. that, that would make sense. However, last time I lived there, I didn't want to live in Oakwood because I wanted to be downtown, right? And mm -hmm. so I had the, the schools did not play a role in my my decision making, mm -hmm. and so schools are going to be uh, uh, are going to be important for you. A uh, walkability might be important for you, or it might not matter at all. Our good friend TK. Uh, T.K. Coleman, mm -hmm. he just moved to South Carolina from Los Angeles. And, and Obviously, he doesn't care about hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he's in Atlanta while the hurricane is By the way, I hope on. everyone in South who lives in South Carolina hearing this is yeah. safe and sound and their friends and family and stuff. It's and crazy. anywhere in the Carolinas, for yeah, sure. But um, one, he lives on, uh, uh, he's moving to like this, uh, the, there, I guess there's an island there that you have you can drive to. and for me proximity to the office is really important like we live two and i live i live two and a half miles from the studio mm -hmm. right here and so i can walk here if i want to um or if i'm going to drive here it takes me you know just a, uh, less than 15 minutes to get here right mm -hmm. however for him uh, he wanted to be in a neighborhood that he, that worked well for him. He had the grocery. He wanted he wanted to be away from. He wanted to be really close to nature and wanted to be away from the sort of hustle and bustle of the city. So he drives thirty to forty five minutes each way to mm -hmm. work and back because he doesn't mind the commute. In fact, he enjoys the commute for him because it allows him to listen to audio books while he and gives him some alone time. For mm -hmm. me, if I had, I remember when I was um, well. Actually, here's here's a, a similar example when. Uh, I got the promotion. I was working downtown Cincinnati. I still live downtown Dayton, and I made that 55-mile drive. Sometimes it would take me an hour and a half, two hours to make it down to Cincinnati because I wanted to live in Dayton over Cincinnati. I, right. I, had, I had a preference there, yeah. right? And part of that has to do with logically looking at these things and saying, okay, here are my 100 preferences, 50 preferences, whatever they are. Write them all down with the people in your household, yeah. but then also realize the logical side that isn't going to get you 100% of the way there sometimes it's about how a particular neighborhood or city or community is going to make you feel it's unquantifiable you just know you feel a certain way when you're there so they got a list of 50 preferences uh -huh. they can't obviously honor all 50 preferences I right. mean, maybe they can't. I'm not saying it's impossible, but probably sure. not the right expectation. No, and th but then you prioritize and you say, what is most important to me? And so each of you picks your top three. Here are the things that really make the most sense. Bex and I did our top five, mm -hmm. and we had a list of the things that are, well, here are our 10 preferences. Now, there was some overlap for mm -hmm. us as well. And, and realizing like, okay, if you're getting this, I may not get this. Right. But what is going to be the thing that makes us most happy together? And realizing, uh, I know Bex, she really wanted to live like she, close to the beach when we moved out here. Mm -hmm. But like we also realized, we weren't. It wasn't a big enough preference that we were going to use it. That, that we were going to use the you know, access to the beach every day. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we still have access to the beach now. We just have to drive half an hour west to to get there, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 realizing like, oh, just because it's right there, you live a block from the subway yeah i don't know how often you use it well yeah i've actually not been on it once yet but i i was thinking i was talking to mariah about this the other day um we need to get on there and just like ride the subway for a day and kind of check it out i mean i've done but that with it, Ella. Takes, it takes an hour and a half or like hour and 20 minutes to get to santa monica from the subway I could right. drive there in like 30, 45 minutes depending exactly. on traffic. Yeah, because you have to you have to go downtown in order to, to get Transfer there. And stuff, my, yeah. my point is, it sounds really good when you move there, but if mm -hmm. that, it, you're like, oh yeah, if that becomes your decision for, for 
moving there, it, we can justify anything. We start to say, well, yeah, it's really close to the subway. That's why I'm moving there. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I use it once a week. Right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, or, now for me, walkability is something that is most important. I walk places every day. I, yeah, I go often, you know, we were talking about this before the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go three, four five days without using my car. Yeah. Sometimes a week without using my car. And, and, and that's why that was something that was like top on my list. Great weather, which you're going to get pretty much anywhere in Los Angeles was was part of the thing on my list. In fact, it was one of the, the big bummers for me living in Missoula is I'm really affected by sort of like seasonal, they call it seasonal, depression. Or, seasonal but, grayness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and Missoula gets really gray in the winter, snowy and gray. Yeah. And uh, it's very Pacific Northwest plus snow. And, and so there is like this nine month period where you have to deal with winter. And um, it it definitely affected my mood because I wasn't able to walk a lot outside. I'd have to go to the gym and just walk around the track for hours at a time. Right. And it was just not appropriate for me. Mm-hmm. In the summer, it was great. Yeah. It was really great. But after that, it was like, oh, like this isn't, this doesn't match my preferences. So if we're, if we're talking to uh, Javier here, and I, I think you have to get really clear on what, if you and your wife sit down and say, okay, there's, there's the three of us, my wife, our seven-year-old son, and me, what? does my ideal neighborhood look like? Is it in Orlando? It, it may or may not be. You might love your community there in Orlando. Mm-hmm. It may be somewhere else. You might move over to St. Petersburg because you're like, I really like how, how great it is over there. Or St. Augustine. Or, you're, or maybe you go somewhere else altogether. Maybe you go to Dayton, Ohio because mm-hmm. y- the cost of living is so cheap there. And you can, by the way, you can design video games from anywhere in the world. Or maybe there's a place like uh, LA or elsewhere where there's this big video game design community and it makes sense to have proximity to those people. That's one of the reasons we we came to Los Angeles. We wanted proximity to, I mean, in in LA, you get proximity to people. This is where entertainment is, where people go to make movies and tell stories and uh, be on our podcast. We have access to more people here than we did in Missoula, Montana or somewhere else. Yeah, dude, and I cannot agree with you. I cannot agree with you more about just because the neighborhood is less expensive that you're going to have like a less quality of neighbors. In fact, thinking about that, <laughs> like in the nicer neighborhoods, you actually might have worse neighbors. You know what I'm saying? Like true. you can have good or bad neighbors no yeah, matter where how, you how go. Do you, how do you define good and bad, right? Right, exactly. Like, what does a good neighbor look like to you? Because um, yeah. well, I was going to talk to talk about this during the added value, but I sent you that documentary. I don't know if you, you saw it yet on, on Dayton, Ohio. It. Yeah. It's yeah. called Left Behind America. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends in Dayton aren't very happy with the way Frontline portrayed the city. Right. Because there's a lot of despair in this documentary. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. But um, it shows the despair side of Dayton, and particularly West Dayton, where we're trying to build the, the grocery store there. There's yeah. not 40% of, the, of Dayton's population lives on the west side. There's not a single grocery store in the, the entire west side of Dayton. Yeah. And, and, but there's also a whole bunch of uh, drug overdoses going on in Dayton. There's a whole like overdose police force helping people out because Golly. there's an opioid epidemic there. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that people... Uh, a lot of people lost their jobs there when GM left, mm. and there were very physical jobs. So very physical jobs often lead to back pain or shoulder pain or knee pain, ankle pain, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so they were prescribed a lot of opioids uh, during you know the, this period of time. And then you lose your job, you lose your insurance, and mm-hmm. then you can't afford the prescription drugs. And people are often turning to heroin. And there's a whole bunch of overdoses because there's fentanyl mixed in with the heroin now. And and there's a huge like drug problem going on all across America. I mean, Dayton is just like Buffalo or Rochester or Akron or Toledo or or, or any of these other cities where a lot of manufacturing base was was established and then people lost their jobs. But what the documentary didn't show, it, it, it showed a little bit of the hope. At the very end, there's like five to 10 minutes of, oh, there's actually hope here because there are people in the community. Mm. In West Dayton, one of the, the poorest neighborhoods in the country, yeah. there are people over there that are that, that are working on a solution. There's outstanding people in this outstanding city. <clears throat> They're trying to build a grocery store. There's whole, just, just so much revitalization going on yeah. in Dayton. They didn't show that piece. They, they, they shined the light on the problems and gave you a little bit of hope. But to me, it's 50-50. 
I saw real hope there because of the community, because the people are working together. You and I have worked together at the House of Bread in Dayton a bunch of times. Yeah. And you realize, like, these people who are volunteering here are people who are making $25,000 a year. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not rich. Right. And there are other people who are making $250,000 a year who are also volunteering right next to them. Yeah. Because they have a common objective, and it's helping the people in their community. And so ultimately, the question is, how are you going to find a community in which you can participate? Now, participating might mean working in a soup kitchen. It it might mean doing Habitat for Humanity. Or it might mean just going and having game night with the other people in your community, if that's something you want to do. What does participation look like in, in, in your plan here? 